And today I'm honored to bring back Lynn Alden here to discuss her latest piece of in-depth analysis, the Bitcoin consensus paper. So Lynn, thank you so much for joining me. Happy to be here again. Thanks for having me. I have to admit, I had to read this paper more than once um, to try to get it all to sink in. And uh, I would love your help just breaking down some of this because I do think the topics are so important right now. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, your paper categorizes Bitcoin's stakeholders, and it really highlights their varied levels of power and engagement in maintaining Bitcoin consensus. So let's just kind of set the scene, um, get everyone on the same page. Let's first just start very simply. How do you define Bitcoin consensus? And then who are the key stakeholders in maintaining that consensus? Sure. And, and for, uh, to start out, I would want make sure that the um, other authors are attributed. So we have Ren from Electric Capital uh, and Steve Lee from Spiral. Uh, and actually, they, I mean, they put more into this than I did um, because this is a blend of technical and economic analysis. And I, I focused a lot on the economic side um, and had to rely on some of their expertise for some of the more technical like software aspects of the paper. Um, and so it's called Analyzing Bitcoin Consensus Risks in Protocol up Upgrades. Um, and we, we try to go back like blank sheet of paper and say, how, how do upgrades in Bitcoin happen? How have they historically happened? How could they happen in the future? And what are some of the, the risks or challenges of that upgrade? Um, and we don't analyze any specific change, um, but instead we just kind of analyze the whole process of changes. We don't take any stance on any given soft for, for or against. Um, and if someone was, for example, uh, more conservative or more against changes, they might you know, point to some of the risks in this paper to say, here's what we have to be careful of. Whereas if you were for some of those changes, the paper still might be useful because you can say, well, here's the checklist of risks we want to uh, minimize as we go through with our proposed upgrade. Um, so, so back to your initial question, consensus is basically, um, you know, making sure that blocks and transaction types are meeting certain criteria. Um, a really good example is the block size, uh, which helps keep the network uh, manageable in terms of uh, bandwidth and storage. And so every block has a maximum limit for um, like how much data you can have in that block. And if you go over that limit, you're considered out of consensus. Uh, so that, that's like one example. Um, but then there's other things as well, like what types of transaction types are allowed, what kind of inputs and outputs, and how does the script work? So Bitcoin, compared to many other cryptocurrencies, has, has fairly uh, limited scripting methods, uh, which is by design because that reduces attack surfaces and complexity uh, in exchange for being more limited and, and more kind of straightforward uh, for what it does. So who are the key stakeholders so that we let everyone know, really, um, everyone that's going to be needing to pay attention to this? Yeah, so um, we kind of that's kind of like the economic part of the paper. And that's that's what actually what I focused a lot on for, for my part of the paper um, is those stakeholders. So when we look at the whole Bitcoin network, there's not any one type of entity that that, you know, runs it or, um, you know, has has some sort of stake in it. So we we. Um, broke it up into six, um, and we had to deliberate a little bit to figure out how many different types of stakeholders we're going to define, because certain stakeholders could be grouped together and others could be split out. And the way we went about it was saying that every stakeholder group has to have a sufficiently different power and uh, incentive to wield that power. If two stakeholder groups are technically different, but they have very similar powers and incentives to when they might use those powers, then they're effectively, for this purpose, the same stakeholder group. Um, and so that's how we kind of came to, to six as the number. So one of them is uh, economic nodes. Um, so that's that's entities that are running full nodes. Uh, but then in particular, you know, not not every node is created equal. So for example, a major exchange, their node, what they're defining as Bitcoin, uh, generally is more impactful than someone who runs uh, you know Bitcoin Core on their own and barely ever makes a transaction with it. So we we look at you know ex major exchanges, major custodians major payment processors. Um, these are, you know, economic nodes that are doing a lot of throughput, a lot of volume, uh, very influential on the network. Um, so one is economic nodes. Uh, another one is, of course, miners. Uh, miners have a different set of incentives. Uh, and then we have um, uh, protocol developers. Um, and they're the ones that actually write the code uh, that gets you know, consider what we have as Bitcoin. So they 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 maintain the safety of the network. Um, they implement some of the changes that we have over time. And 
it's important to keep in mind that most changes to the software are not forks. So Bitcoin Core is updated regularly, and a lot of them are safety uh, improvements and just making sure it's continuing to work properly with modern like operating systems. And then only rarely is there something that's considered an actual consensus change. Um, and then there's another type of developer, a fourth group uh, that is application developers. So even though they're, they're in a similar situation where they're writing code, you know, instead of contributing to, to Bitcoin core, they might, for example, be writing a new type of wallet, or they might be um, working on an L2 that they that they want to build. Um, these are these are kind of um, uh, more like application or or user specific ones. And if you look at the two different types of developers, generally, if you're a protocol developer, you're leaning toward conservatism, safety, making sure the system is running. That's kind of your your biggest priorities. Whereas if you're an application developer, you might generally want more features. There's there's more tools that you can do with with your application. So obviously it'll it'll depend on the individual, but that's why we kind of separate them because they have a little bit different incentives and a little bit different powers for how they operate. Um, and then we have investors, so just entities that are holding a large amount of Bitcoin, um, and or even just just millions of people that are holding moderate amounts of Bitcoin. Basically, people that have relevant amounts of Bitcoin because um, obviously you have an incentive on the on the network working uh, and appreciating in value and being better than all the alternatives that are out there and that it's operating safely. Um, and in the event of a hard fork or a chain split, you have the power to sell the coin that you're not in favor of, uh, which okay. we saw back in the Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash um, split. Um, and uh, so, yeah, those are the basically the, the major breakdown. Oh, and the last one is media influencers. Right. Um, so basically, uh, that would include yourself is is anyone that uh, has an audience uh, that that um, P, whether it's miners listening to it, investors listening to it, developers listening to it. Um, there's different types of of influence with people that um, can voice their opinion and help either guide things for or against certain outcomes, uh, particularly around the idea of soft forks or or even in some cases hard forks. Coin Stories is proudly brought to you by BitDeer, a global leader in disruptive technology for Bitcoin mining and AI. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer boasts a massive 2.5 gigawatts of electrical capacity and infrastructure under development across three continents, positioning BitDeer as one of the most diversified and power-dense computing companies in the world. BitDeer's leadership pioneered the original advancements in Bitcoin mining ASICs and is now poised to disrupt the market again with groundbreaking new designs for the next generation of mining ASICs that are targeted to reach efficiencies of as low as 5 joules per terahash by late next year. Now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. Yeah, and I recommend people read the block size wars because I, you get a good sense of sort of the characters in that group who are trying to influence people one way um, or another. I want to dig into forks a little bit because a lot of people celebrate Bitcoin for its immutable nature, but it really has undergone some changes in the past via soft forks and hard forks. So for people in the audience who maybe don't know what the difference is, let's just first start by explaining um, a hard fork versus a soft fork? And how have these changes been activated in the protocol in the past? Sure, so a, a hard fork is a change to the network that is not backward compatible with existing nodes. Um, and a really simple example is increasing the block size. So if there's a block size limit that all the nodes enforce, um, and, and you come out with a new client that says, let's increase that, Let, let's double the block size or quadruple the block size, your new type of node would say, okay, the, these these bigger block sizes that that miners are putting on the network, uh, these are valid. Um, whereas the the older ones are saying, no, these are over the limit. They're not valid transactions, so they don't get added to our, the blockchain as far as we define it. And so you have a split. You have a you have two different coins at that point. Um, and the entire history of transactions up until the split are the same. Uh, and so any holder now has both sets of coins. And you know, if it's, a, if it's a very minor hard fork, I mean, I, I I could you know hard fork Bitcoin right now, and it wouldn't matter because I'd be the only one that knows about it. Um, but if there's a significant uh, like dispute 
uh, where a lot of people, for example, want bigger block sizes and a lot of people don't, then you actually have a fairly economically significant hard fork. You have two different sets of coins. And if someone's not really sure which one's going to win, they can just hold both. And eventually the one that loses the, will, will kind of reabsorb its, its monetary premium back into the one that wins. Um, or if someone is, is highly convicted about which one is either likely to win or ethically should win, whatever the case may be, then they can sell uh, the coin that they don't agree with and use it to buy more of the coin they like. And that, that helps determine also for their own benefit how they perform and then also what happens to which coin wins. Um, and a soft fork is a backward compatible change. And that's, you know, like the, what we know as Bitcoin today has gone through multiple soft forks. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a narrowing of the rules. So it's something that says it meets all the prior rules, but then there's also some additional rules or details that it's following. And an example would be if you wanted to reduce the, the, the block size, because if you reduce the block size, you're still meeting the older rule set because you're mm -hmm. still under the prior limit. Um, but now you're even below a, a lower limit. Um, and so that, that's, that's not an example that's happened, but that's like an easy to, to conceptualize example. Um, and then as for how changes were made in the past, uh, that's evolved over time as Bitcoin grows. Uh, and that's actually also a reason for why we did the paper is because the, the, the network now is somewhat different than it was even back in 2017 when there were more, con uh, you know, uh, disputes around soft forks and hard forks. Mm -hmm. The network's kind of evolved since then. So we wanted to kind of recheck how a lot of this might might function or kind of analyze some of the the risks and pathways we've seen so back in the really early days it was literally as simple as satoshi made an update like that's <laughs> that's how soft forks and sometimes even hard forks were done it's just like you know the network was so small and you know he would just be like okay hey guys i i updated it so everybody everybody uh change your node now and they'd be like okay and it just you know that's kind of the year one of bitcoin it's not not particularly decentralized at that point even though in theory, the network is ready to be. It just takes time to spread. And then after several years, uh, it starts to actually be uh, challenging that even even Satoshi himself wouldn't be able to just, you know, convince everyone like, hey, OK, here's here's what we're going to do now. There'd be significant parts of the network that would be like, ah, I don't want to do that change. Yeah. Um, and so now it's more of a negotiation around how this change happens. And the interesting thing about it, so it's called rough consensus, which means there's no there's no like formal definition of what is sufficient to do a soft fork. Mm -hmm. So there's no like Bitcoin council where like 30 out of 40 members have to agree. And then we officially have consensus. There's no, there's no formal governance. Yeah. It's more just like a, a series of messy things and then eventually it changes or it doesn't. Um, and, and there's been different methods to activate a soft fork. It could be that developers uh, put out like a software update that in some future block will start implementing those newer soft fork rules, which gives everyone time to update before it, you know, so it doesn't cause an issue. Other times you can use minor signaling where you kind of like put out the software that allows miners to either signal for the change or against it. And once you hit some predetermined threshold, um, then those upgrades can, can start happening, assuming again that the economic nodes um, are in favor of it as well. Um, and so that's actually, that's one of the more complicated things is that people disagree on what changes should be done, if any, uh, and by that I mean consensus changes, not like, you know, minor changes. Uh, and then two, even if you agree on what change maybe should be done, what is the fairest and safest way to launch that change? Uh, and so that, that's actually part of the reason why it's so um contentious sometimes. And one of the things that, that the paper looks at is what are the risks of, you know, certain activation scenarios. Right. Well, in the paper, you introduced the concept of state of mind as this important factor when you're maintaining consensus or considering changes to the protocol. So can you explain really what that is and how you envision um, it affecting the likelihood of successful soft or hard forks in the future? Sure. So, you know, we, we can operate sometimes in a little bit of a bubble or, or like little Bitcoin echo chamber uh, where, you know, if there's like a soft fork being negotiated, we might assume everybody knows that's being that's being just talked about. Um, whereas, you know, there, there are tons of people in the world or tons of entities in the world that are just not, you know, living and breathing the Bitcoin ecosystem all the time. They're, someone's a, a doctor and they hold some Bitcoin and they don't they don't read or think about Bitcoin on a regular basis and they might just be unaware whether 
there's a debate around a soft fork or not. Um, and so we analyze that it's, it's, it's really the, the ones that, that are on the ends of the spectrum that are most impactful for the success of either a soft fork or a hard fork compared to the original network. And so we separate into six categories and there's two that are in for it. There's, there's one that's very much in for it to the extent that they're willing to expend resources and time to, to increase the odds that that change happens. Uh, the next one down is that you're for it, but you're not, you know, you're not, you're kind of passively for it. You're, you're, you'd, you'd prefer that to happen, but you're not really on the front lines, you know, trying to make it happen. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's people that are fully against it and they're willing to expend resources to try to prevent that from that change from happening. Uh, the one, the one next to that is that you're, you're generally against it. Uh, but you're not maybe losing sleep over it. You're not willing to expend resources to make sure it doesn't happen, even though you prefer it not to happen. Then we have two in the middle. Uh, one of them is that you are aware of it and you're neutral. You don't really have a, an opinion either way. And then the other one is that you're you're neutral because you're unaware. You literally don't even know that this is being discussed, or maybe you heard of it and don't even know what it is. Uh, you don't really care, or maybe maybe you would care if you knew, but you just don't know because you're not living and breathing in the, eco, in the Bitcoin ecosystem all the time. And so one of the goals of the paper is to kind of pull more people if possible outside of that middle category, uh, especially because you can have potentially pretty large entities that are, that are not kind of closely following this on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so, yeah, those are the six categories that we broke down uh, because uh, obviously if you're, you know, the majority of entities are probably going to be somewhere in the middle where mm -hmm. they're just not following this regularly or they, they follow, but don't, they don't really have the bandwidth to have a high conviction opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas those polls are really what, what make changes either happen or, or get stopped from happening. It's so interesting to think about that spectrum, like uh, the apathy that exists. Probably a, um, a lot of that is because people just don't understand the really technical components. And then you have the extremes of financing, wanting to finance more uh, Bitcoin core development. And then on the opposite side, wanting to you know, basically finance the the dis discouragement of any uh, activity happening and more of the ossification. So um yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So your analysis really underscores these risks of coin splits and network fragmentation during the hard forks. And I think of Bitcoin Cash with, um, you know, the SegWit activation as one of the, the big examples. So what do you think are the most critical factors that could either mitigate or exacerbate these risks in future protocol changes? Because a lot of people are worried that there are going to be more changes. So one is understanding the process that, that that was kind of one of our key motivations for writing and, and publishing the paper um, is to um, kind of educate both ourselves and others um, on what are what are the risks that could happen um, and what is the history of different activation methods um, and what are what are kind of how they might be be different now in the world of ETFs and you know major corporate treasuries and and things like that which is very different than what we had for example, back in 2017. So I think the first one is education. Um, the, one of the specific risks that we identified in the paper uh, is a bounty claim, um, which can get a little bit technical, but I think we can we can break it down uh, in, in fairly simple terms. So when you look at the kind of the history of, of Bitcoin, um, at least the, the changes that are still considered Bitcoin rather than, for example, Bitcoin Cash or something. Um, these changes have generally been implemented by Bitcoin Core and its predecessors. So it's not as though some alternative client came around and said, this is the soft fork we want and everybody shifted to that. Instead, the existing rolling team of core maintainers and developers uh, would eventually agree to implement a change and the economic nodes and the miners would agree to implement that change and run that new soft software. And what's really important about um, nodes in general, the node software, is that developers can't push updates to you. They, they can't just press a button uh, and then your node updates to the new version. They can only introduce, they say, here's, our, here's our upgrade. And most upgrades don't contain any soft forks. Uh, they're just bug fixes and you know, optimizations to make sure they keep running in, in modern operating systems, right? So computer systems are different than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so every several months, you generally have an upgrade. Uh, 
Occasionally, they'll have a soft fork in it. If there's been a lot of consensus to do so, as far as all the entities are aware that, that they, they've kind of achieved consensus. Um, but they can't push it to you. So it's only like, you know, over time, people update. Uh, part of the papers we analyzed uh, on average how long it takes for people to update. And it, it can be a year or two in many cases that people will purposely wait to update uh, to make sure that the new version is bug free. Um, or if, if there's a soft work in it, they might see if others are adopting it first and then they might start adopting it. Um, and so that's kind of the first thing to realize. But one thing we point out in the paper is that the, the core maintainers kind of have a pretty significant veto power because mm -hmm. if they just decide you know, maybe, maybe you could even have a case where 90% of people want a certain change and the maintainers, this is not their priority right now, uh, right or wrong. It just, it's not happening. Yeah. And so you could, uh, in theory, have a scenario where another group comes along and says, well, here's an alternative Bitcoin client. And our alternative Bitcoin client either maybe doesn't have a soft fork. Maybe it's just, you know, different usability written in different uh, software language, things like that. There are other blockchains like Ethereum that do have different clients uh, that are that are mostly compatible with each other. Technically, in Bitcoin, we have alternative clients as well. It's just that we have, you know, the vast majority of the market share uh, is Bitcoin Core. But in mm -hmm. theory, if you wanted, if if there was a contention around a soft fork, right? So, and this is different than the Bitcoin Cash because that's a hard fork. But if there were a prolonged contention around a soft fork. You could have a group launch an alternative client that's basically a fork of Bitcoin Core, um, and people and entities could choose to run that. Mm -hmm. And that's where we kind of uh, get into pretty interesting game theory and create the potential for a bounty claim, because the majority of those proposed changes have certain opcode changes and enable certain L2s um, that the existing Bitcoin, uh, for different reasons, does not not have those opcodes. It could be safety reasons. It could just be just because they haven't been thoroughly agreed upon yet. Um, and you can have a situation where, like, let's say that alternative client convinces the majority of mining pools to adopt it. And because there's pretty significant mining pool centralization, um, that's not that many individuals to convince. So you mm -hmm. could have a case where the majority of miners or mining pool, like the majority of hash rate has adopted this, this new alternative client kind of going around core. Um, but then you could have very slow update by economic nodes, right? So maybe maybe 20% of exchanges and custodians up, update uh, and the other 80% don't. Um, the, the risk of a bounty claim there is that on that new, uh, like that new alternative version that miners are currently enforcing, um, you, could, you could build locked value on that L2, right? Okay. So you could build millions or potentially billions of dollars worth of, of you know, locked value on that. It could be DeFi, it could be faster yeah. transaction speeds, any number of L2s they could be building. And then if that, if that gets significantly big enough and the majority of nodes still have not recognized that rule set, uh, even though they're still working with the same consensus because those, those new rules are a soft fork. They're not violating the old rules. It's just that the old nodes don't really recognize those new details. You could have a case where the majority of miners go back and actually hard fork from that new code back to the old code. And they could just actually take all the value on that L2. Oh, wow. And, and the 20% of economic nodes that in this case have updated, they would be like, that's, you, you've hard forked, what are you doing? Wow. And the other 80% are saying, no, it's just, it's still following the old rules. We never agreed to the new rules. And then you have a, a chain split. And you have uh, generally people that probably have been excited about that change, that are using that change, that lost value in that change. They're probably gravitating toward that, you know, that 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 forked version, whereas mm -hmm. the majority are kind of gravitating toward the the existing rule set. And so that's that's one of the key risks that we identified. If you do have a kind of contentious alternative client situation, which is again not to say that you should never have alternative clients. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to have that option because that's that's a key thing that, that makes it so that Bitcoin is not controlled by its core maintainers. Mm -hmm. But it is just identifying some of the risks that can happen when you do have maybe miners and economic nodes on, mm -hmm. on somewhat different sides of a, of a given change. It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. First up, Casa. It is so easy to set up your Bitcoin three key self custody with Casa that I can show you pretty much the whole process in just 30 seconds. You're watching it right now. 
I recently switched to CASA for multi-sig collaborative custody and inheritance planning because of their enhanced non-KYC required privacy and the ease of this mobile app. Make sure to watch the tutorials and get your CASA plan for 10% off at casa.io slash Natalie. Next up, Speed Lightning Wallet, one of the fastest growing Bitcoin wallets out there. Speed is a secure, low-cost way to send and receive Bitcoin and stable coins instantly. The app is super simple to use and customers love it. Download Speed using the QR code on the screen or the link in my show notes. Use promo code COINSTORIES10 to get 5,000 free sats. Next up, CoinKite. You know how much I believe in self-custody, and when it comes to cold storage wallets, none are better than the cold card. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. And finally, are you ready to take control of your wealth? The Bitcoin way is here to empower you. Learn how to take full self-custody and eliminate all counterparty risk. Set up your node and become the master of your own transactions and enjoy true autonomy. And upgrade your cybersecurity and protect your online privacy like I did. The Bitcoin Way specializes in personalized one-on-one -on -one training to help you become fully self-sovereign. Schedule a free consultation today. I want to dig into that a little bit. Um, you know, I think Jameson Lopp was uh, one of the people who recently said that he believes apathy is a huge threat to Bitcoin. And I'm curious if you agree with that. But when I think of people who are apathetic, I think of maybe Bitcoin ETF holders because the, they don't probably care as much as hardcore Bitcoiners do about protocol changes. Um, they just want exposure and probably trust the sponsor and the custodian to manage the underlying Bitcoin. And in the paper, you mention institutions like BlackRock um, having discretion over which fork to hold after a potential split. So how do you foresee um, these ETF sponsors' decisions potentially impacting Bitcoin? Because I've I've heard discussions on Twitter and Bitco the Bitcoin community worried that someday there's going to be like a, a black a BlackRock fork and what that will mean. Right. And so one of the things we actually did with the paper was we reached out to major ETFs and major corporate treasurers. Uh, we reached out to developers reached out to influencers, kind of a, a bunch of those different stakeholder groups. And some, some for some of them, we're able to name them in the paper. And the, some of the other ones, we can't name them in the paper. But we can just say we went up to very, very large uh, entities, uh, major exchanges uh, as well. Um, so kind of all across the gamut. Um, generally, our and we also had legal experts review it because there's perspective, you know, you, you could you know, you, you can look at the ETFs perspectives and see how they might deal with something, or you can look at a corporation's like articles of incorporation to see if they might have language for how they determine something like that. Um, in general, if there's a hard fork, um, individuals are able to move faster than organizations on average. Generally, the bigger organization, the, the more kind of legal risk they might have, uh, as well as the more entities that they would have to um, agree. Right, you might need the board of directors to agree, or you might need, you know, kind of multiple layers to agree. Whereas, you know, if, if you're just holding Bitcoin on a cold card, uh, you know, you can you can make your, you can make your decision on the spot as an individual. Um, and so, I, I do think that the, it's interesting that there are kind of an increasingly probably passive amount of holders mm -hmm. compared to what you would have had back in in say the Segwit yeah. uh, days. Um, and that's not to say that. So, you know, in in our analysis or from from reviewing. Um, the those running the ETFs or those running the corporate treasuries, they would be very aware, most likely, right. uh, of what's happening and and you know wanting to generally do the best for their shareholders or their mm -hmm. um, you know their customers. Uh, whereas probably a lot of those shareholders or a lot of those ETF holders are the ones that were that are more likely to be in that either apathetic camp or just unaware camp or just not 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 having a very strong opinion on something software wise. I mean, I remember. Back in 2017, when I was newer to the space, that's when I wrote my first public Bitcoin article was in 2017, and I didn't have a high conviction view on block sizes. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, probably the original one, but I, you know, I don't really know. Like, I, yeah. I didn't do like a really deep dive at that point yet. I kind of yeah. inched into it over time, um, and so there, there would be a lot of people in that camp that say, I, uh, you know, both sides sound reasonable. I don't really know. I don't study this, right? So yeah. just I'll let it play out. Um, and so, yeah, you can have fairly passive changes. Another thing we kind of identified is that those those six stakeholder groups, their level of power changes throughout the course of a potential 
um, fork, right? Mm -hmm. So in a hard fork, uh, investors are extremely powerful. Uh, you can just rapidly sell the coins that you don't like and stick with the one that you're defining as Bitcoin. Uh, that could be the old one in many cases. That's kind of the in incumbent. Um, or if there's a high conviction that the new one is actually better, you could, in theory, have the, the newer one, the hard fork win. Um, and so that's that's like kind of the unlimited power almost. Whereas in a soft fork, uh, investors don't really have much power up front. Um, and so you have influencers, developers, economic nodes, miners. They're the ones that actually have a lot of influence in that early part of a potential contentious soft fork. And then only if there's something like a bounty claim that then results in a hard fork, would then investors really step in and, and kind of reclaim a lot of the potential power that they have. Uh, in addition, they'd have they'd have certain powers such as funding developers uh, one way or another, um, or f you know maybe funding influencers or otherwise you know using using some of their wealth to maybe influence something. But their actual direct ability is kind of limited until it becomes a hard fork. Got it. Um, just to be a little bit more direct, do you, do you worry yourself um, about the potential for as more institutions capture more and more Bitcoin for them to be incentivized to hard fork it in the direction of something like, you know, making sure that things can be monitored more, everything's KYC, remove the privacy, um, just something that the the Bitcoiners that are really passionate about this being a medium of exchange and the freedom technology component would be really upset about. I think I would if, for example, if ETFs held like 80% of the Bitcoin mm -hmm. or something like that, I would consider that a major risk or let's just say the majority, if they held the majority. Uh, it still is the case that the majority is held by like whales and individuals. Uh, it's had that kind of 15 years of, of distribution. Uh, we're not even 100% sure what percentage of those coins are lost or just like super huddled. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we look at the rise of ETFs, uh, one thing I've generally pointed out is that part of it has been a rotation. So, you know, even though now there's something like a million coins in the ETFs, um, there were already over 600,000 coins in GBTC. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've really only had, a, you know, a few hundred thousand of like net uh, coins going into those types of entities. Um, and any kind of additional inflow increases the price a lot. And so it's, it's actually pretty hard to capture more and more coins into those entities. Um, I do think that there's a risk that if, if Bitcoin is not easy enough to hold um, and that not enough people are educated about it, that they're more likely to hold it through those indirect methods, which then gives yeah. those custodians power. Yeah, It's kind of a similar thing that happens with stocks, right? If you're an individual stock holder, you have votes over, you know, shareholder proposals and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you hold it through Vanguard or BlackRock passively, uh, then basically you're giving your shareholder votes to them. Um, and right. so Bitcoin's not not quite the same way because it's not actually voting. Um, but as someone who who you know can hold coins yourselves and make a decision if there's a a hard fork or otherwise be involved. Um, I do think that's a long range threat to monitor. I don't consider the numbers problematic at the time. Um, you know, we also look at things like mining pool centralization. So even though miners themselves are pretty decentralized, there's no there's no miner that has, you know, even double digit percentage of the hash rate. Um, but mining pools themselves are are fairly centralized. And, and the good news is that miners have, you know, they're not they're not like it's not like they're letting the pool custody their, their machine. So if a, if a pool that they're using does something they don't like, they can redirect their hash rate to another pool. Um, so it's, I don't really consider that problem existential. Um, but there are a number of risks I monitor. I also monitor things like supply chain risks for like, you know, ASICs, oh, which yeah. are not, that's not something we covered in this particular paper. Um, so there are a number of risks that I monitor. Um, as far as, you know, you mentioned like Jameson Lopp and, and just the, the, the general views of, and concerns out there. Basically, the, the two camps in general, and there's a spectrum of, of camps, obviously, but the, the two general directions are, one is that some people are concerned that there's still low hanging fruit changes to make to Bitcoin yeah. um, that would make it better with little or no downside. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's others that say even those, and, and to go back, those would be concerned if we just stop changing here and only do non-consensus upgrades now and mm -hmm. never have some of those additional features that might make it more private, more scalable, more usable without mm -hmm. sacrificing, you know, core things like decentralization and security. 
Um, whereas conservatives would argue that even those small changes are risky, that it's hard to fully know um, what implications they might have um, and that they either leaned absolute or pretty close to absolute for we don't really want any more changes and that and that the more it ossifies, the better. Um, yeah. I, so I, I generally I generally think that uh, the the kind of the core the flow here is that the bigger and more decentralized the net, the network gets, the harder changes come. So we talked about before that in the very beginning, Satoshi could just make a change, and then maybe five years in, it wasn't he was gone. It wasn't that simple anymore, but it was still a fairly small, you know, close knit group. Uh, whereas now it's, you know, now, now, now we're at the sovereign level and the ETF level and the global right. level. So changes are harder. I, I generally fall somewhere in kind of the moderate conservative camp, which is that I'm, I'm pretty conservative with, with changes that I see. Um, you know, if I, if I put myself as a stakeholder, I'd be somewhere between investor and influencer. I'm not a developer. I'm not, you know, I'm not writing code to make the changes. I can just you know, if there's a hard fork, I can sell the coin I don't like, and I can I can give my opinion to audience, um, and they can take it or leave it. Uh, I could I could I can fund developers one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the way that I would kind of influence some of that. Um, but in general, I I kind of fall on the side of, you know, Bitcoin's near immutability is a really key feature. Uh, that the last thing you ever want to do is break or disrupt Bitcoin. Um, but I am generally convinced that there are small changes, they're fairly conservative soft forks um, that can probably add new features for privacy and scalability mm -hmm. that don't really take on a lot of risk. Whereas there's maybe other changes that uh, I would view as you know more progressive or more uh, unbounded or, or like less bounded, where I would I would say that I don't really have the technical assurance that that would be safe, and therefore I would default toward no. It's so interesting to hear your perspective, because I do think what underlies this whole paper is this debate on protocol ossification. The fact that some in the Bitcoin community believe that we should refrain from making any changes at all to the Bitcoin protocol um, because they're worried that it could impact the decentralization or the security, the 21 million. And then others feel like, hey, we should be open to making changes. And especially um, th this is why I, I wanted to talk to a Bitcoin core developer and I brought Gloria on because it almost seems like if there's financing behind it, you're incentivized to kind of tinker, right? Because otherwise, what are you what are you doing? Just sitting there and looking at you know monitoring and not proposing any changes. So the incentives are, are interesting, but then you go back to that game theory of Bitcoin. Everyone's incentivized if you're a stakeholder, if you're holding Bitcoin, whether you're apathetic or or not. I, I mean, you want it to go up, right? So the game theory seems to be on our side, and at this point. I would I would imagine that you agree with Andreas Antonopoulos, who said it's like pretty much impossible to attack the network because if someone were to be able to get fifty one percent, you could just hard fork it and basically say bye bye to those, right? Yeah, I mean, I I think that there's I don't like to view it as invincible, but it is quite strong. So I still like to monitor risks, um, even if there were a fifty one percent attack. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one like for example, in proof of stake networks, if some entity gains like a supermajority, uh, they can make that permanent because they can make it so that new stakers can't even enter and and try to wrestle that back. Mm -hmm. So that you really kind of have to do a fork to fix that. Whereas in proof of work, uh, you you in theory can get out of a 51% attack by bringing more hash rate online. Uh, yeah. There's you know it's not it's not like the, it's not like that 51% majority can prevent new miners uh, from attaching to the network in the same way that stakers can. Um, so whether it's preventing 51% attacks or uh, whether, it's, whether it's preventing uh, malicious bugs that, that otherwise disrupt or damage the operation integrity and, and kind of reputation of the network, um, I think those are risks to monitor. Um, and that's kind of one of the arguments for the more conservative side is you want to keep it as simple as possible to reduce attack surface. Um, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, to, to some of the more progressive arguments are basically saying that kind of to your earlier point, if Bitcoin is not flexible enough and therefore kind of just congeals into major custodians, um, mm -hmm. then it could, it could fail to kind of achieve its network. So you can actually, you can actually lose decentralization in that way as well. Um, yeah. and there's, there's some sort of balance that I think Bitcoin is currently either at or, or you know, close enough to. Um, but I don't think people should really rest on their laurels. I think that, you know, you always want to be monitoring risks uh, and you always want to be seriously considering uh, 
you know, kind of low hanging fruit changes that that might make Bitcoin better. I mean, some of the some of the things we have today, like the Lightning Network and other features, right. uh, exist because of prior soft forks. Um, and so, if you if you had kind of you know not changed from that point, Bitcoin would look very different and maybe not as usable today as it as it is. Um, and I can imagine five, ten years from now that there's maybe some you know pretty conservative forks, and then people look back and say, "I'm really glad that that happened because we have mm. this." You know, more usable network now that allows us to use it more privately or use it as as uh, medium exchange more easily and more um, uh, cost, uh, you know, economic costliness. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm in general I have my opinion on any given fork, but the paper mm-hmm. itself um, doesn't take a side in terms of conservatism right. versus progressivism. It just kind of lays out the field as we see it. Uh, and the one thing we do actually is we also open source the paper, um, so it's on GitHub. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're not really kind of presenting ourselves as like, this is how it works. It's more like we did initial work over months. Uh, we, we reached out to all the, like I said, all the exchanges, like mm-hmm. not all, but like a lot of major exchanges, ETFs, corporate treasurers, developers, uh, application developers, all, all sorts of different, um, stakeholder groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, we put in a lot of work to kind of, you know, have the initial draft that's out there. Um, but then we're inviting people to either contribute to it or even consider being maintainers for the document um, because we consider this just a start. It's a living document that tries to analyze um, what are the risks and changes, how do changes even occur um, so that it increases the odds that, you know, that should any changes happen, that maybe they'll be safer. I love that. And I really think that the paper is a call to action just to become educated, um, even if it's intimidating that some of this is a little bit technical. Everyone should really be aware of the debates and the, the discussions happening because this really goes down to the health and stability of this network over the long run. Um, OK, well, I will link the paper to this. But while I still have you, I'm sure that my audience is very curious. We just had this big election. Um, the market is responding with all time highs. So can you just share maybe um, your reaction to what's happened and your macro outlook just zooming out maybe summarize it so i think that the the breakout is a good signal right so we've we've been consolidating in price since march of this year um i think that the launch of the etfs kind of pulled forward some demand so you had a Mm -hmm. little bit you know overly high sentiment um you know people kind of bid it to the moon and it takes time to kind of digest that change we kind of went through that um, I think we would have eventually broken out either way, regardless of how the election turned out. But um, obviously, there, there's even though there are Republicans, and Democrats that are on both sides of the issue, and right now in, in American politics, the Republican side is is generally more favorable toward Bitcoin mm-hmm. uh, than the Democratic side. Um, you know, there's talks about a strategic reserve. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, explicit statements that that people should be able to custody their own coins, or you know, and and maybe even have it like not be taxed. And so I, I generally take the under on major changes. So like what I guess in four years from now, do we have a gigantic Bitcoin reserve or is Bitcoin tax free? Uh, That'd be cool. I wouldn't, I wouldn't really base my investment decision on that being the case. Um, But in general that, that, you know, regard, I'm not making a statement around politics, but basically in terms of this specific industry, that was generally seen by the market as the more favorable choice. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that where I'm also more conservative is around privacy. So I think that while this election had major um, impacts on, for example, the SEC and broader crypto securities in general, mm-hmm. um, and then maybe things like Bitcoin strategic reserve and stuff, I doubt it's going to be super impactful for these problematic um, laws around privacy, or in mm-hmm. some cases, not even laws, but just like regulations by uh, entities, how they interpret the law. Um, and for example, even going after like non-custodial privacy services and things like that. Um, and so I, you know, we, we talked about risks earlier in this. I, I still think one of the biggest risks of the network is kind of this, this anti-privacy push yeah. um, that the United States government and others have. And that's that's pretty challenging to, to change in the near term. I think it's going to be a longer battle. Um, and I, I think even public opinion is kind of on their side at the moment because people still have this this mindset that like, you know, why do you need privacy? Uh, it must mean you're up to no good or, you know, kind of Bitcoin's only used by like money launderers and druggies. And it's kind of still the mindset that a lot of people have. And that's why I think that education is so important and, and the work you're doing um, to, to keep educating about it. Um, in general, I'm pretty bullish for 2025. Uh, I think that uh, 
Um, liquidity is probably going to be pretty good over the next 12 months. Um, and I generally expect Bitcoin to probably be higher 12 months from now than it is now. Obviously, no guarantees. Um, but that's kind of my base case at the current time. And I think that yeah. one of my kind of macro views on the election is that nothing stops this train, yeah. which is to say that there there are people that are pretty convinced we're going to see a big budget reduction or something like that. And I don't really see that as that is likely. Um, when we look at major areas of government spending, uh, it's mostly actually not on, you know, kind of certain bloated uh, government employee areas. It's actually these really big core areas, things like mm -hmm. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, defense and interest. Uh, and, and that kind of alone is like 100 percent of tax receipts. Um, and one of the things I found interesting is that you've had you've had somewhat of a shift in the Republican Party over the past decade, which is that if you go back a decade, that was kind of the Paul Ryan era, which was, you know, kind of a, a, a more um, push toward trimming some of those uh, areas. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, for example, the 2024 Republican um, platform officially said we don't want to touch Medicare or Social Security. We don't want to reduce it or increase the retirement age, um, which used to be more of a, a Democrat position. Um, and so if. if there are certain aspects where the current Republican Party has shifted a little bit more toward like what we see in um, like European conservative movements, which is that they might be a little more social conservative than there are other parties there, but they're not necessarily super fiscally conservative. Uh, there's there's different parts in that kind of political spectrum that that um, politicians and voters can fall on, and so I, I generally um, assume that deficits are probably going to continue, um, but I'm going to monitor you know, bills and legislation as they come up and, and see how this goes. Yeah, we're so grateful for your analysis, Lynn. And I have to be honest with you. I mean, I still feel like neither candidate really addressed the elephant in the room, which is the $200 trillion of unfunded liabilities and how we're really going to sustain all this debt. Um, all paths lead to the money printer. We hear even legendary investors discussing that as a huge risk. BlackRock is putting it in their presentations. And I have to say, I mean, I think that I think it worries me and makes me a little bit bearish um, because I just don't know how this can play out. I I had Mark Moss on and he was saying it's it we will crash, but we'll crash up because they're going to have to print. But it's like that makes me concerned about hyperinflation. So it seems like on the one end um, is this deflationary bust depression scenario, which they obviously can't afford and won't allow. They have to go in and print. But how long can they really print? And as you've sort of alluded to in previous conversations, we ping pong back and forth between red and blue, this party to that party, but the end result is more asset inflation that crushes the middle class and the average person, the working person's quality of life is deteriorating. They're not able to afford the things they once were. And I just, I mean, obviously Bitcoin is the life raft, but not enough people understand that. And it, that makes me worried. It makes me worried that they would call for draconian things um, and maybe even be against Bitcoin because people are so scared in that type of scenario. Do you do you feel that way at all? I agree. That's that's part of what motivates me to to write about it, um, to, to, you know, because I, I provide investment analysis um, mainly for investors, but I also put out things that I just consider that I want to be out there. Like, yeah. for example, writing a book is not a particularly economic activity most of the time. It's generally not the highest ROI thing you could be doing. But I wrote it because I, I felt that I, I had to, um, that I wanted to have a, a more complete argument around money that's out there that people can point their, their friends yeah. to. Um, because I, I do think that's a, we're seeing it in Europe uh, to some extent, probably at the most right now, uh, which is that um, you have pushback against Bitcoin. Uh, mm -hmm. They're kind of in the then you, yeah. then they fight you stage. Yeah. Um, and the way that I phrased it before is if a decentralized spreadsheet threatens your system, it's not the decentralized spreadsheet that's the problem. It's your system. Uh, right. But that's how that's not how a lot of people see it when, you know, their own paychecks and their own, um, you know, ec economies having a problem. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the earlier idea of either a deflationary bust or a hyperinflation, I, I tend to fall in the slow melt up camp. Uh, that's kind of the nothing stops this train camp, which is yeah. that um, large monetized fiscal deficits are generally going to keep continuing. Uh, they're very, very hard to reduce at this stage um, because it's kind of recursive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I generally don't see hyperinflation in any sort of near term uh, uh, sense. Uh, 
um, because you know we're not even at like emerging market stage yet. We're kind of like dabbling in, in how a lot of emerging markets function in terms of finances, mm-hmm. uh, and most of those are not in hyperinflation. We you know there's 13 trillion dollars worth of of uh, global um, dollar denominated debt uh, that the different entities have, and that all of that is in flexible demand for dollars. So this is a like a Gordian knot. Like this is a really kind of like entrenched network effect. Mm-hmm. And it's very, very hard to hyperinflate the dollar, maybe the, in the long arc of time. Right. So I'm not talking things like, you know, if you look at 20, 20 years or so, I don't really have an opinion at all that we'll, we'll get closer to that. But when I look at an investable time horizon or, or kind of a political time horizon of, of say, five or 10 years, mm-hmm. I don't really see something like hyperinflation on the table. But I do see something like emerging marketification of U.S. finances, that we we enter a phase where we're structurally running these bigger monetized deficits. And then the, the, the key risk there is that if you're on the wrong side of those deficits, you're kind of getting siphoned away. And if you're on the right side of the deficits, then you're, you're doing pretty good. And then that's how you can build up more and more populism, uh, more and more frustration that people have. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're because they're, they're, they know something's wrong, but they're not quite sure you know, what the nuance of that problem is. And that, mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the thing that I, I get concerned about. Well, and the solution, people are screaming it right now, Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin, sell your bonds, buy Bitcoin. Um, yeah. I'm going to echo something you ended your paper, your consensus paper with to a long, healthy, prosperous Bitcoin. Lynn, thank you so much. I hope everyone gets your book. I hope everyone reads this paper. Also your global liquidity report with Sam. I thought that was fantastic. I'm gonna have the links to everything in the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Thank you. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. This show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open. If you want to share feedback or guest suggestions, just reach out at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Make sure you're subscribed to the show and check out my free newsletter, nataliebrunel.substack.com. I'll see you next time.